uh, our second part of session 20 in the kingdom exploration. Uh, God is restoring our understanding of the gospel of the kingdom of God in the earth today. It's not an American phenomenon. It's not a European. It's not African. It's not Asian. It's global. God is speaking to his people throughout the whole earth. One of the things I, I like is that Jesus, I believe, has spoke to me one time, and he says, I came here to change the world. He didn't come to simply fix the world. He came to change it. He brought a new civilization. He brought a new culture. He not brought a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new creation in Christ that behaved, acted, and saw things totally different. And I think there is a reasonable manifestation of the kingdom of God that we should uh, look for and anticipate. Several years after Pentecost, the Apostle Paul would provide a somewhat reserved measure of definition and clarity of the understanding of the revelation of the kingdom of God, which the Genesis church, the early church, was commanded and commissioned uh, to declare, display, and demonstrate within the context of a broken, hostile, antagonistic, and resi resistant world. I think somehow we fantasize that the world that the early church brought the message of the kingdom and Jesus to was somehow less difficult than the world we are living in. And I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's true in the slightest bit. If anything, they were more antagonistic, they were more hostile, they were more fractured, and uh, we need to understand that we have no excuse that the gospel that Jesus has given to us is as good today, or if not better, than it was in the early years. Now here's that definition I spoke about. It's in Romans chapter 14, verses 16 uh, to 18. Let me just turn there real fast. Romans chapter 14. It says, Therefore, do not let your good uh, be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in this manner uh, is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now verse 19 says, goes on, uh, verse 19 says, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. So the kingdom of God is not about meat and drink. If meat causes my brother to stumble, then if I love them, I will not eat that meat. If wine causes them to stumble, then I will not drink the wine. And I will not manipulate them or try to use some sort of religious talk to try to justify myself. Righteousness, peace, and joy are the fruit of fellowshipping with the Father through faith in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Righteousness, peace, and joy are the fruit of fellowship with the Father through faith in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. They're, they are not the results of obedience to institutional religious regulations and restrictions. You don't follow a bunch of law and a bunch of rules and come up with righteousness, peace, and joy. Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. They'll reign in life. Reign in life. Romans 5.17 Reign in life. Not simply endure, but reign in this life. If we will receive the abundance of grace 
and the gift of righteousness. It's a gift given to us. Now, I went through, um, I went through more than 28 versions of verse 17. 28 versions. And in every one, it, it speaks, it's so similar. It says righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Uh, life, living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the English Standard Version in the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy on and on and on in the Holy Spirit. Living, uh, the contemporary English version says, living in peace and about true happiness. All this comes from the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy, which the Holy Spirit gives. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Produced by the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit. The joy that the Holy Spirit gives. In, 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 in. American King James. American Standard Version. On and on. And it says here in, the, in one of them, it says that it's through the Holy Spirit. All of these things are given. And when I fight and I argue about the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. You're like cutting off your nose to spite yourself. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces this within us. And we must abide in and live in the Holy Spirit. I think we, we have failed to understand the significance of the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But this definition says that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that it is like this. The message of the kingdom. And it says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I believe the message of the kingdom is right standing before a holy God on the basis of His great gift of righteousness. My righteousness is given to me by the one who is my righteousness, not in my own self. And when I try to contend for my own righteousness in any way, I am defeating the purposes of God. I believe that the ministry of the kingdom of God is reconciliation of the breach between God and man resulting in peace. Not only do I believe in reconciliation between the breach between God and man, but I believe there's a reconciliation between man and man. There's a reconciliation between the Jew and the Gentile, between the male and the female, between the genders, between the generations, that we need to look for these things that are providing us with reconciliation. The reconciliation should result in peace. Um, the manner of the kingdom is the relationship and pre-fall fellowship renewed with God producing joy. I believe that when Jesus came and paid a sufficient price, He paid a sufficient price to bring us back to a pre-fall condition in fellowshipping with God. That we are able to approach God, to come boldly into His presence, to hear Him, to walk with Him in the cool of the day, and all that God had ever intended for us has now been restored back to us. And we can know Him in that way. Now, sadly, many of us do not. I understand that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to press on. Not that I've already arrived, Paul says. But I press on that I might know him. I might know him. And knowing him. Not just simply knowing about him. But the manner of the kingdom of God is relationship and pre-fall fellowship. Now for me, what happened when I look at the fall in the book of Genesis the first thing I see that came in when they made a decision to receive the law of sin was shame and fear. Shame and fear. <coughs> and when God deals with the whole arena of shame 
and fear in my life, it will produce joy in my fellowship with Him. No longer am I afraid. No longer am I running away. No longer am I, uh, am I hiding myself because I heard your voice, Lord, and I hid myself for fear, for I saw myself as naked. No, there is no shame. There is no fear. Why? Because Christ has paid it all. Christ has been the one who has done it all. And I think we need to recognize that. Look with me at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. And somebody please read that out. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Loudly. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet free adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The res res the received what? The reconciliation, you have rec atonement. Mm -hmm. The atonement produced reconciliation. While I was yet a sinner, far away, he died for me. We quote this all the time, but we don't, we don't live it out. I have been reconciled, reconciled, reconciled. Peace has been made. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we want to look at verses 18 to 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. And we pray in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Reconciled is used how many times in those few verses? Three, four, five times? We have been reconciled and we have the ministry of reconciliation. How can I reconcile people to God who I don't like? How can I reconcile people to God who I am not reconciled with? Who I am not walking in peace with? If I don't recognize that He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, not just my sin, but your sin, and your sin, and your sin, and your sin. And I recognize that the reconciliation comes by what Christ has done. For all. 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 It helps the way I look. And I become an ambassador. So many times we use those terms as an ambassador of Christ. But we don't walk in the manner. We don't share the heart. We don't know the heart of the King to be an ambassador. But I believe we're learning. And that mind says we are pleading as though God were pleading through us. I remember one time, and this is a confession of sorts, when I first, uh, some 25 years ago, I began, uh, Jan and I began to do mission trips overseas. And we began to preach in, in different uh, countries and different places. And I made a statement. Before I had done that, before I had gone overseas, I had made a statement here in Seattle, in this area here where I lived, and I said, I'm never going to beg any man to, 
to be right with God. I'm never going to beg any man to receive Christ because he paid too high a price for it and it would cheapen the price that Jesus paid. So I would never beg anybody. I would never plead with them. I would never weep. And then God showed me his heart. And then I was able to stand and just plead and cry and weep and tears and beg men, don't turn away from this opportunity. Now, right here in this place is the moment God will meet you now and cry and weep and beg and plead that none should perish, but all should come to everlasting life. Because I have been reconciled while I was yet a sinner, so are they. It's so much harder to get unsaved than it is to be saved. There are people who have been saved. The blood has been applied. Their name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. They just simply need to receive it. They need to walk into it. They need to become what God has already done for them. He has already paid a sufficient price for every man, woman, and child. He doesn't have to pay a new price tomorrow for another hundred people. He doesn't have to say, oh, well, I guess I'll have to go back to the cross because I didn't figure that tribal group would ever come. No, we haven't asked God for enough souls. We haven't asked God for a big enough movement in Lewis County. We haven't asked God for enough to impact this, this, this college. No, God says, I have paid a sufficient price. While they were cursing me, while they were blaspheming, while they were hating me, I died for them. I reconciled them. Now go tell them. Go tell them. Go show them. The man, his message, his mission. As individuals, and as kingdom communities of redeemed men and women, we must become increasingly captivated with the heart and the works of the man, Jesus of Nazareth. I, I, I use those words, we need to be captivated. It needs to capture us. And if I'm going to be an ambassador for this one who is my king, I must be captured by his heart. We must allow the Holy Spirit to progressively restore and proclaim His message of the kingdom of God. We must work towards fulfilling His mission of destroying all the many varied manifestations of the works of the devil. It says, John says it so clearly in his first letter. He says, Jesus was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. All of them, not some of them, not a few of them. And so we need to be about that. We need to be about it. Cancer is not the work of God, my friend. Disease is not the word. Insanity. And I may not understand it. Please, I'm not trying to have a bunch of answers here. I'm just saying I will not be satisfied until I walk in the fullness of all. All the disease, all of the insanity being destroyed. I believe that as the day of the Lord and the return of our King to earth to establish His righteous reign over the entire earth approaches, there shall be an increased anointing and there will be a greater release of kingdom technologies among and through His church to accomplish this mandate upon and through our lives, the Holy Spirit is releasing technology and tools. Technology and tools of the kingdom of God. Things we have never seen before. Things that are happening. I've been in, I've been in villages in, in Odisha, India. I remember uh, we were there, my wife was with me, and I said, we'd been teaching on the kingdom of God, and I just simply asked, how many of you would like to receive the power of the Holy Spirit? No, the power of the kingdom of God. I didn't mention the Holy Spirit. I said, and 300, over 300 people stood to their feet. 
And so I began to pray. I had a faith base for grace, and I prayed out of that. And within a few moments, the whole bunch of them got filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to prophesy. They began to, to move out and speak in tongues, and they began to do things. We never taught about it. We just released it. We need to get out of ourselves, and we need to go on. There are new technologies. We must rediscover the beauty of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. We must rediscover and recover his message of hope for our world, the message of the kingdom of God. As God restores the gospel of the kingdom to our practical understanding and daily application, there will be increase of faith and trust beyond anything we have ever known in the past. Somebody open your Bible to Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Anybody in any version, Joel chapter 2, verse 25, loudly. Joel chapter 2, verse 25, louder. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts. The other locusts and the locusts swarm. My great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. Verse 25, did you read that? Yes. 2.25? No, 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 I'm just, maybe it's another, I'm looking for one thing that's not in that version. That's the NIV, right? Let me look for someone else, someone else in another version. Do you have a Hebrew vision? Is that what you're reading? I will, in a complete Jewish Bible, I will restore to you the years of the locust ate. The grasshoppers, shiver worms, cutter worms, my great army that I sent against you. Okay, that's all I need. I will restore the years. Let me say something to you so you understand completely what God intends to do. When God restores the years to you, He does not restore you back to where you were when the locusts arrived. He restores you to the place where you would have been had the, had the locusts never come. Had they never come to your life. He'll restore you to all those harvests. All those harvests. What if there was a, a, a multiplication? He'll restore that. He'll restore that. All those years since the time of the attack. Now let me tell you clearly, when God brings a restoration the book of Acts is not a goal. It is a seed that the Father has planted into the earth and it died. It was perverted by locusts, by religion. But when God brings a restoration, my friend, at the end of the age, it will be as though we had never fallen. We had never lost. We will be restored to a place so grand, so great, that the whole world, and not only the world, but those angels and principalities and powers will marvel at the spectacular spectacle of the glory of God among His people. If you can believe it, God will restore all that's been lost. And the church at the end of the age that greets Jesus and presents the kingdom to him will be greater than the church at the beginning of the age that said, bid him adieu. It'll be a greater church. Not less church. Not a defeated church. Not an underground church. It'll be a church triumphant, mighty in battle, with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. There will be no lack. And the kingdom will be manifested in every way. Because it will be in this way that God will glorify himself. God's glory will be on display, demonstrated. 
The Holy Spirit should restore the church to where it would have been had it never been pirated by religious despots and dictators for their own financial profit and political gain. And that's exactly what happened when Constantine and Roman empires took it, when people began to use it for their own purposes. There's a manifestation of the kingdom of God that's conditional upon receiving and obeying the directives of the Holy Spirit, who is the executor of our Lord and the King of God, Glory's estate, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is present now, and the executor of the estate is the Holy Spirit. He has been given to lead us and guide us and direct us to be the administrator of the kingdom of God. And the expression of the kingdom of God is progressively displayed and demonstrated within the daily marketplace lifestyles of those who have entered into the kingdom of God through an act of relinquishing to the Holy Spirit their rights of self-determination, self-reliance, and a sense of entitlement. You see, we were never made to live out the kingdom of God in a box on a corner. We were never intended to live out the kingdom of God on a holy corner during holy hours with holy people doing holy things. God intended that everyone should do everything, everywhere, all the time. That we should go into the marketplaces. We should go into the businesses. We should go into the schools. We should all have a manifestation of the kingdom of God resident within us. And this is being brought forth as we relinquish to the Holy Spirit's governing our rights of self-determination. I'll do it my way, thank you very much. Self-reliance. I know better than God. I know how to do this. I can get this done. Or our sense of entitlement. God, you owe me. How many of you have ever prayed for a good Sunday school teacher? And we start our prayers, Lord. God, heal her. She's such a great servant. She's been so good. And we start bartering with God on the basis of what that person did. No! It's on the basis of what Christ has done. I love what the person did. I'm not disagreeing with that. But that's not, the cry, that's not the basis for healing. It's not my righteousness. It's my, not my sense of entitlement. How many of us approach God on the basis of entitlement? Like, God, you owe me. We do the same thing on the opposite. I can't approach God because I haven't earned it. That's why we don't lay hands on a sick and cast out demons. Because I haven't gotten holy enough. I haven't gotten grown up enough. See, the sense of entitlement goes both ways. Not only do we pray that God should bless somebody because of all the great things they do, but because I haven't done great things, I'm not going to be deserving. Both are a lie. There is a culture, a culture that is being cultivated even now. It's a culture being cultivated right around us. An expression of the kingdom of God. Now, I believe that before the Lord returns to consummate the full establishment of His kingdom upon the earth, there will be fully functioning communities of redeemed men and women living in holiness, wholeness, humility, and honor in the fullness of all that Christ has accomplished through His life, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, and restoration of full fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. See, there will be a people upon the earth who will provide a full and true, complete testimony. True, full, complete testimony.
There has to be. Wait, you're laughing? I, I spelled it with an A and then I put a dot over it. I can't remember whether it's an A or an I. I think it's I, isn't it? It is. Thank you. That's my editor for you. Thank you for the smile. There will be a full, complete, total, true testimony of what Jesus has done. This will be a witness to all creation of the exclusivity and sufficiency of the sacrifice and offering of the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. Now when I say all creation, I mean all creation, seen and unseen, on the earth, below the earth, and in the heavens. All creation is watching us today. I don't know if you know that. Principalities and powers are watching us today. Demons are watching us today. Angels are looking at us today. They're watching. What are we going to do? What will be the witness of our testimony? What will we say? How will we act? How will I receive what God has said? What will I do with it? This evidence and witness will provide proof that God's judgment is entirely righteous. Therefore, there must be a complete testimonies and culturally relevant expressions of the gospel of the kingdom of God, which justifies by example God's wisdom and plan in all that Jesus of Nazareth did in obedience to the Father's command. People ask me, how come you can be so sure, Dave? How come you can be so rock solid sure that this is going to happen? Because I am absolutely positive that God's judgment is righteous. And that the wrath of God against sin was poured out upon Jesus of Nazareth. And there will be a people, there will be a people who will live in the fullness of that reconciliation by the blood. And there will be a demonstration and a display of that. Marriages will reveal that. Families will reveal that. Lives will reveal that. There will be testimonies. These disciples of the kingdom of God will cultivate, nurture, and guard the culture of the kingdom of God in full open view of all creation upon and under the earth to the glory of God. See, I don't think you understand. I don't think the world understands. I don't think the church understands. If there is not a full testimony... If there's not a true testimony, if there's not a complete testimony, the case is thrown out and people are found guiltless. Think about what I'm saying. It doesn't require all that Jesus did upon the cross and all that Jesus did in the grave and all that Jesus did upon the altar and all that Jesus did on 40 days and His return to get done what He told us to do. No, He has paid a sufficient price now, 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 unto Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all you can think or ask according to the power that is in us now. See, we have everything we have need of to accomplish everything He commissioned us to do. And as we do that, as we walk in holiness, as I walk in wholeness, as I walk in humility, as I walk in, in honoring one another, and I learn and I walk that out and I defend that, then the principalities and powers, uh, they see the wisdom of God that was hidden in Christ before the beginning of the foundation of the earth, and they are persuaded and they are convinced the judgment of God is righteous and true. The judgment of God is true and righteous, and no man shall stand and say, we didn't have an account, we didn't have a witness, we didn't see it. We didn't know you expected us to believe you did that because of him. I'm looking at that man. What about my life? What about my life? What kind of testimony? Am I giving a true, full, complete testimony of what Christ can do for a man by the way I treat my wife, the way I pay my bills, the way I act and I talk? You see what I'm saying? See, if people had to rely upon my testimony, would they be held accountable? Am I, is there a standard? Is there a plumb line of testimony? 
What will they say? You wanted us to believe you did that for me? When I looked at the Roman church with all those priests abusing all those boys, you expected me to believe that Jesus was real? When, you saw, when I saw all the disagreement among the body of Christ, when I saw how the Mormons did this and, the, and these guys did that and these people killed these people, the, 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 the Lutherans killed the Anabaptists, the Catholics killed these people, the Anglicans killed the, the Methodists and on and on and on. You expected me to believe every generation, every generation will point their fingers and say, that's the testimony? My friends, God will have a testimony. That is full, complete, whole. And no one will be guiltless. No one will be guiltless at the end of the age. And God is restoring that now. We're going to go through the next couple of weeks. We're going to look at the book of Acts. I want to see that first testimony. And I want to believe that God is going to restore a greater testimony. I want to see how they turn the world upside down. A handful of people turned the world upside down. They actually turned it right side up. And they brought it to God. They prayed and they sang inside of prisons and earthquakes came and, and prison cells opened up and whole communities came to Christ. A deacon went down to, a, to the city of Samaria and began to preach Christ and his kingdom. And the whole city was filled with joy. That's the testimony we'll have among us. Amen? 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 Amen or oh my? Come on, amen or oh my? Amen. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. And God, we dare to believe you. We dare to allow you to capture our hearts and give us a vision for the whole earth. You said you'll go into the whole earth as witnesses of me and what I have accomplished. God, we thank you for that. Be with us through this week and speak to our hearts. Stir us up to love and good works and cause us to come back and to share your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is doing and saying in the world today, in my life, and through my life, for your glory, for your honor, for the praise of your name, and for the pleasure of your heart. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. And amen. Thank you. Thank you.